<laughs> so we're good? Yeah. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's great to be such a large crowd on such a rainy night. <laughs> and all of you have sixth grade students, correct? And uh, do they participate in today's yes. assembly? So I know yours wasn't there. I think so. You think so? Did you, they, they talked to you at all about what we might have discussed? Perfect. They were perfect sixth graders. It's exactly, that's, that's exactly. So it was a really a wonderful uh, opportunity. I had all the sixth graders uh, here in the gym. They were fantastic and great. Uh, and uh, tonight is kind of a, a parent version of what I did, but kind of helping you out. Um, just real quickly, uh, you had sent the memo out to bring the, uh, the parent user's guide. Did you bring your parent user's guide with you tonight? Yeah. Yeah, the one they gave us at the hospital. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, so you didn't bring yours. No. All right. Well, uh, I'll let you borrow mine later. I, I, I've got uh, 24, 22, uh, 13, and 10. So I got uh, little kids, little problems, big kids, uh, big problems. Uh, my name is uh, Coach Randy. Most people call me Coach. I'm a professionally trained life coach, motivational speaker, speaker, and as you said today, all around great guy. Um, my wife actually teaches, or she used to teach. Now she's an instructional specialist here in town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so what we did today is talk a lot about, not just about bullying, but kind of how to stand up. Because sixth grade is one of those wonderful years uh, before they become teenagers. I, I, I tell a story about my daughter, who's now 25, when she went to sixth grade. And she went from a Jewish day school of about 25 kids to a public school with 250 kids in the classroom. And like any parent, are you a crazy neurotic parent? It's okay, you can admit it. Here's only three of us. Right? Right? So... I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm, kind, I'm kind of that kind of neurotic kind of parent. Uh, and I remember when she was finishing fifth grade, I asked her, would it be okay on the first day of school, you know, if I dropped you off and kind of walked you over, right? And immediately she said, what do you think she said? No. No, of course. Uh, but I worked on her over the course of the summer. I figured at some point she'd come. And so about half of the summer, I saw her when she came back from camp, and I said, sweetheart, school's starting up. Would it be okay the first day if I just dropped you off? She said, no, okay? So I kind of gave up until like the week before because I'm starting to panic because she's going from a 25-kid class to 250 kids, middle school, and kids can sometimes be not nice, and if you're, especially if you're a new kid. Uh, so I always ask her, so about two days beforehand, I said, Jess, seriously, can I please just drop you off and just I'll, I'll, par I'll park far away. You can go to class, and I'll kind of stand across the street, Right? And she said, no. no. So it's a day of. My mind's still working. I'm not going to give up. Uh, we're driving through to school. And as I'm driving there, I swear, there must have been 70 parents across the street. No, sir. I swear to you, 70 parents across the street. And I said, sweetheart, look, I'm not the only crazy parent. I go, you see that last row of parents? I'll stand behind them. I'll be that far away. Can I please? You know what she says? Okay. No. no. Oh, she still says no. So what happens is some kind of universal intervention. I drop her off, and I pull out, and what do I see? An open parking spot right on the side of the street. Now, my feeling is if I wasn't meant to get out of the car, right, there wouldn't be the parking spot. That's how my mind works. So I'm thinking there's divine intervention. I go ahead. I park the car, right? Now, I, told, I, I must ask her two dozen times every time she said what? Okay. No, right? So I come walking back. Like, I'm trying to sneak, you know, and there's this big Douglas fir tree, and I'm, like, kind of peering around, peering around. I just want to make sure this kid's okay. I just want to make sure she's okay. And I, I'm, I'm peering around, and finally, I turn around. Hey! How are you, right? She's like, Dad, you know, sweetheart, I'm sorry. I just, want, I just want to make sure you're okay, right? I just want to make sure that you're fine and you're not scared. And this is an honest response. I was fine until you got here. Right? And I went, oh, wow. And fortunately for me, um, I learned that. So I didn't do it with my son when he went to middle school. But I, I realized that she really was okay. But my presence being there reminded her not to be okay. And so it was really this kind of dichotomy of what to be as a parent. And I actually went and spoke uh, at, a, at a Catholic school, Mother Seton High School. Uh, later on, I kind of talked about that experience. And the girls in the Catholic school said, you know, I mean, you need to trust your kids. Because I talked about that. She goes, my parents are that way too. And it's really hard because of what we knew. Uh, and I want to talk about the focus because uh, I watched my daughter 25, 22, 
And the world in which they live is remarkably different than the world we lived in. And I want to spend some time talking about that, but our goal today was for them to be better students, better people. So every time I said better students, they said better people. And I must have said it at least two dozen times. And that's because I know as a speaker, 85%, especially sixth graders, 85% is literally forgotten the moment they leave, right? They'll retain, right? Maybe 5% by the end of the day, 1%, and all I want to remember is better students, better people. Because uh, by sixth grade, we're looking to really do that. And I came out here, we did uh, a survey, which uh, many of your kids were involved with. And we found some really interesting information. I'll, I'll, I'll fill uh, a, few, a few pieces of it, but it was very wonderful to see how kids are in this school district. And the one thing we found over and over again is the amount of empathy kids have. It was like off the charts, higher than across the national. And that was really nice. So the fact that they understood this, better students, better people, is the ultimate goal of a sixth grade program. Because by now they know bullying is not nice, everything else, but it kind of changes. Uh, and what I would like for you to do is kind of be here, which is not hard for you to do. There's only three of you and you can't hide. Uh, but I realize you have kids and if your phone goes off, whatever, you know, just go ahead and just take the... It won't because there's no cell service, but if, if whatever it is, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, hey, look who just got here, right? Thank you for being here. Now, what I want you to do, right, is how many of you would like to go back to middle school? Would you like to go, would you go back to middle school, Ken? So I, I went to a time when we had junior high school. That'll, that'll, that'll age, age me, right? So what do you remember about middle school? Seventh and eighth grade for me. Mm -hmm. I just really, I actually really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, I liked what I was learning. Mm -hmm. I had good friends. Mm -hmm. How about you? Um, I went from a small private mm -hmm. school to mm -hmm. a large public school. Mm -hmm. Ninth grade of a seventh, eighth, ninth yep. school. Mm -hmm. So that was a hard year. I remember mm -hmm. to transition. Mm -hmm. um, clicky. Mm -hmm. I mean, I made really good friends. Mm -hmm. I still am friends with a lot of my high school friends, but mm -hmm. it, took, it took a while yeah. to, to acclimate. Mm -hmm. A little different. Yeah. Sixth and seventh, I was in a public school. It was mm -hmm. horrible. <laughs> um, middle school girls can be mean. Uh, and then I moved to England. Oh, wow. Which is hard to do in middle school, mm -hmm. but turned out to be way better. Way better. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> and so as you think about middle school... Uh, I know for me, I was bust. I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and it was right when we had, you know, desegregation, and I was bust because I lived in a particular area in town. Denver, it's Denver County, so there was 22 high schools, 40, 50 something middle schools, and hundreds of elementary schools. We're here in New Jersey, so if you met, what, what county is this in? So if you can measure Somerset County being one school district, that's how I grew up, uh, and so where I live was in Southeast Denver, and I was bust 45 minutes to a, an area across town. Uh, and so that was like, that's a pretty long bus ride to go from one place to another. And I remember walking in, and because it was mixed races, uh, the biggest fear was the shower in the locker rooms. Because back when I went to school, you had to shower when you, did, when you, when you went to gym. It was this part of it was. And so if you can imagine uh, what goes on in a person's life when you're sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade, having to take, and it wasn't just like those showers you walk into and you can put the curtain, they were these gang showers. Right, uh, and it was a very intimidating. Because I was a, a short kind of Jewish kid, and uh, other kids were bigger. And I just remember immediately trying to realize that I had to. I started judging people, and we were being compared to each other. Uh, so I would never want to go back to middle school, never. Um, and today it's even so much different than we went, right? Uh, and I talk about middle school in a way. Now, is, are any of you educators? Any of you? Okay. Uh, when I grew up, we had uh, fire drills. Did you have fire drills? Or, because uh, I lived in we had something called duck and cover drills. You familiar with that? Remember what the duck and cover drill was? Like a tornado drill or something. No, nah, it's not a tornado. The duck and cover was the fact that I went underneath a little desk because a nuclear weapon was being thrust at us from what we now refer to as a former Soviet Union, right? And we would get there one. And it was kind of funny to think that this little desk was going to, it was really kind of a joke because a nuclear bomb, we had seen what it really does. Uh, Nowadays, things are a little different. You're familiar with lockdown drills, right? Uh, and so my Michaela, uh, who is currently now in eighth grade, uh, was in sixth grade a couple years ago, where your kids are, and we got the text that said school was in lockdown. 
Now, I don't hope you ever, ever had that experience as a parent, um, but you can imagine, I just told you I'm a crazy kind of parent. I got that text and I immediately freaked out. And I called, I called Chess, calm down, relax, the school's got under control, and everything was fine. So when Michaela came home, we said, what was it like? What were you going through? And her first comment was, this was a sixth grade kid, I'm just glad I wasn't in the bathroom. What are you talking about? Out of all the things, I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, oh, yeah, I never go to the bathroom. Now, my Brianna, who's now in fifth grade, was in third grade, and she says, yes, I never go to the bathroom in school either. I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, I don't want to be in the bathroom in case there's a lockdown. Do you know what you have to do if you're in the bathroom in case of a lockdown? Sit on the toilet, like put your feet up on it. You have to literally go in, right? Stand on a toilet. Lock the door. Lock the door, right? And there's no adult there. And, there's, and, there's, it, it, and you don't know if it's a drill or not. And the fact, and so this is what we live in. And yes, our schools do everything they can to protect and plan. And I, I, teach, uh, I teach college. We have out of sight lines. And the world in which they live is so different. You know, we could go to school and just, just go to school. And we could like it or not like it or make fun of it. Just our favorite class was whatever. And so you take the idea about being in a middle school kid and throw other pieces on. We have found that our kids are overstressed and overanxious by the time they get to middle school with tremendous amount of anxiety and fear. And we as parents, all right, don't necessarily realize that because we equate ourselves with what happened to them. So if you can, please be here and understand that middle school, especially sixth grade, is one of those really shining years. The other thing is I'd like for you to please be open. If you could just cross your arm. Very nice. Now cross your arms the opposite way. I do this with the kids today, too. I'll ask you the F question. How that make you feel to kind of cross your arms? The opposite way, a little awkward, a little weird, right? If I haven't done so already, at some point, I'm going to talk about some stuff that's going to make you feel weird. And you're going to say, yeah, but. So say, yeah, but. Yeah. You know what a yeah, but is? Yeah, but it's not my kid. Yeah, but it's not this community. Yeah, but all these other yeah, buts, and I'm going to tell you, that's not necessarily the case. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to, the fact that you're here is to empower you to figure out how to have conversations to deal with some of the things that are foreign to us. Completely for we were joking about um, the Walkman, you know, not too long ago. We, we, we were talking about, uh, um, I forget your first name? Stacy. Stacy has, still has a Walkman, right? And the cassette and everything. And these kids have no idea. They, they, they push a button. They don't, you kids don't have to leave the house and get educated, all right? Push a button. So the world in which they live is so much different. So at some point, you're going to say, yeah, but that's fine. But I just want you to plant a seed in the back of your head, not to scare you, but to raise your awareness about how we can be our help, our help our kids become better students, better people, right? And what I'd like for you to do is I want you to think about a bully memory you had growing up. Think about a bully memory, and I'm going to ask you, because the three of you are together, is kind of share your story with each other and give you a couple, couple, couple minutes. And whatever kind of bully, either you're a target, you're a victim, you're a bystander, whatever came to mind, and just real quickly share your bully memory that you had when you were, it could have been, it could have been last week, who knows, but some kind of memory with each other. Oh, for real. Friday. No, for real. I tell you, this is a real thing. I'm not stopping. So I, I have one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Middle, middle school, technically. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Eighth, eighth grade. Mm -hmm. um, and we went to a very small school, mm -hmm. parochial school. Mm -hmm. You know, should have been very mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember a bunch of the, you know, a handful of the girls just decided they were going to, Stop talking to one of the other girls mm -hmm. for no re no reason. Mm -hmm. Just just totally iced her out. Mm -hmm. And this it went, on, it went on for a little bit, and I wasn't involved, but I didn't really do much about it mm -hmm. until a teacher totally called me out on it mm -hmm. and said, "You need to put an end to this. Mm -hmm. Everyone else will listen to you. Like you have you have to make it stop. Mm -hmm. It's not right." And so I had to call her, mm -hmm. apologize, mm -hmm. say, I'm sorry, you know, sorry this is going on, mm -hmm. sorry this is happening to you. And then I sort of, like, had to phase her back into mm -hmm. the group. Interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. And I'm like, this look, I'm that person. <laughs> so when I went to sixth grade, I was coming from a very tiny private Catholic school, going to public school for sixth and seventh grade. So I was the new kid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the tall, thank you, new kid. Mm -hmm. which, you know, I've never had to pick out outfits every single day. I wore a uniform before that. So mm -hmm. um, girls in sixth and seventh grade are not necessarily nice mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it and it took a long time. I was athletic, so that was my mm -hmm. 
in, but until you have that, whatever that in is for you, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it sucks. Mm -hmm. And even your nice girls, I find, are still sometimes like mm -hmm. not nice. Mm -hmm. And you know it's not the parents because mm -hmm. you know the parents and you kind you know these kids. Mm -hmm. and, but still, I'm, I still find myself very shocked when I hear stuff that comes out of these kids' mm -hmm. mouths to one another. All right. And thank you so much for sharing. Anything for you? So personally, I guess I've been pretty lucky um, in school, at least. That I don't remember, and I, I, I probably get too much into my psyche if I thought about other situations. That's right. I, I do coaching <laughs> lessons. Don't worry about it. We'll pick but, it up um, after. But actually, um, my daughter actually was bullied a bit mm -hmm. in kindergarten, mm -hmm. and it was it was definitely something like I didn't even think about. I didn't consider until it happened. Mm -hmm. And she's basically the youngest in the class. Mm -hmm. She basically just makes the cutoff. Mm -hmm. so when she entered kindergarten, she was still four. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, some girls, I think led by one girl, was like, you can't play with us because you're not five. And I was like, what? And so I tried to you know, teach her to stand up for herself and mm -hmm. stuff, and she did. But then she she turned five like two weeks later, and they all turned six like a month later. <laughs> and then it was her and yeah. again. And it became actually kind of bad because there was name calling mm -hmm. and she was upset. There was things like a snack was being eaten. I mean, this is kindergarten. So, you know, I talked to her and I made sure she understood, like, it's not, you know, it's not you, but you do mm -hmm. have to stand up and you have to go tell your mm -hmm. teacher if this happens. I contacted the teacher separately. Mm -hmm. And I was actually kind of surprised because the response was just kind of like, oh, I'll tell the guidance counselor or someone else about it. But nothing actually happened, mm -hmm. but eventually, um, I had already, the girl, my daughter had been invited to this girl's birthday party, and I already said yes, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh no, like, what's, you know, mm -hmm. so I went, and I watched the whole thing, and mm -hmm. didn't see anything, mm -hmm. you know, going on there, um, and eventually, it stopped, so mm -hmm. I, I requested a couple things from the teacher, mm -hmm. like, move her from sitting mm -hmm. next to her, mm -hmm. so she's not tortured all day long, mm -hmm. called names, having her snacks stolen, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so she did that, but then they, she still kept her like next to each other on like the rug, mm -hmm. and then there were still incidents of pushing, and I'm like, you gotta oh. move her from there too. Yeah. And eventually, it all stopped, and they became really good friends. Ah. It was kind of interesting. That's a great story. No, um, so. But I, I basically yeah. just try to empower her to well, like, good. you know, don't be upset about it, don't interrupt. Not take it personally, and that's, you know, for yourself. you know, and so as, you know, so she's in sixth grade now? She's down in sixth right. grade. So, yeah. uh, that's part of what we're going to talk about in terms of how do you help build resiliency uh, and empathy. Um, the thing that we're gonna, this, 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 this concept about the memory that we have, uh, most of us, when it comes to thinking about the, the definition of bullying, what would you say the definition of bullying is? If I were to say, write down your definition, if you're in a large group, you'd actually share with each other, what's your definition of bullying? Being picked on or targeted for mm -hmm. something maybe beyond your control, mm -hmm. your looks, your appearance. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Making someone, isolated else, too. Hmm? making someone else feel bad about themselves on purpose. Making someone else feel bad on themselves on purpose. Yeah, and isolating that person and so that they feel like mm -hmm. they have no friends. Or mm -hmm. And of those different, which ones do you think is right? They're all right. They're all right. And often our definitions of bullying are based on our own personal experiences. How many are familiar with the, what is called the New Jersey Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act? You've heard of it, right? What have you heard? <laughs> yeah, the title, right? And, and that's part of the challenge in terms of uh, parents know about it, it's posted, notices go home, but it doesn't matter until, right? And there, there is a lot. Actually, we've had laws dating back all the way until from the beginning of 2000. Uh, when it comes to the bullying and stuff that we're doing now, um, Jenny, what was a, a situation that occurred in our country that required us to start, or forced us to start thinking about bullying in a different way? Well, well yeah, but this is before the school shootings. This is, uh, this is about, uh, we just celebrated it almost 20 years ago. You know what happened about 20 years ago on April 20th? Columbine. Columbine High School. You familiar with Columbine High School? I grew up in Colorado. I went to Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, I had actually some friends that uh, were, were teachers at Columbine. And because uh, I was a trained educator back at the University of Colorado. And uh, what was unique about that situation? First time I really heard about it. Well, it was the first time you heard about it. It was finally the, the time where we had two individuals, kill lists, came after, and they shut up a school. And 
that kind of forced to say, oh, maybe this bullying thing is something to take serious. Prior to that, how is bullying handled in most places? If you went to a guidance counselor when you were in seventh grade and said, you know, uh, when I walk down this hallway, these kids kind of pick on me, what was the usual response? Ignore them. Ignore them or walk walk another way, right? We didn't know what this was about. Uh, And I'm the state representative for an organization called the Alveus Bullying Prevention Program. And 80% of the law is based on that research. And it's important to understand that this law is here to protect kids. But a lot of times is most people don't know the difference between bullying and conflict and horsing around. And we often take conflict, right, to mean bullying. So the biggest thing to understand about bullying is pr- pretty much three things. It's aggressive, it's repetitive, and it creates an imbalance of power, either real or perceived. So whether it's through electronics, whether it's verbal, whether all those different pieces is irrelevant but those are the three categories. And the law had, kind of had things in place, except in New Jersey, it could be a one-time occurrence. Right? So if you're the parent of a kid who gets the phone call, hi, we have an HIV investigation, your child did this, as a parent, you're going to do what? The response is really not my kid. Right? They had him been horsing around. They were just playing. Now, if you're the parent of a kid who gets the call that says, we found someone who have a possible HIV against your kid, what's going to happen? I mean, I had that, yeah. and I was, I was kind of like, really? Mm-hmm. You said one thing once. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, again, of course. because I, it was a one, it was a one, one time, time thing. Of yes. I knew the kid. Yes. I knew my daughter. I knew. It, and so, it makes complete but some sense. Other parents, I, I think, would probably maybe. And so, that. and so, some of it would happen. Is there was a lot of overkill. Now, in the law. The principal can sit back and say, you know what, this was really HIV, this is code of conduct, it's about culture and things like that. And so we're learning from this. So, but the law has been around for seven years, right? So it starts off with Columbine. So what was the precursor to why we now have the New Jersey Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights Act? What happened that forced this law to start in September of 2011? Tyler Clementi. Tyler Clementi. He took a course. He's very smart, right? <laughs> right? And the, the interesting thing about Tyler Clementi is he was in college. You know who Tyler Clementi is? Does that name sound familiar? He was a young man whose friend thought it'd be funny to set up his laptop and videotape him, right? Having a, a, a situation, a moment with, uh, uh, with his partner and thought it'd be really funny to broadcast it, right? Kid got kicked out. Tyler goes up. George Washington Bridge takes his own life. And now we start, wow, we, this is serious. And that's where we learned a lot about what? Cyberbullying. That was when we first started talking about cyberbullying. But what happens and what has happened is from that, over a number of period of time, there was something called bully side, meaning that kids would take their own life because they were bullied. And it was very important for us, those in the, in the field, that they don't, they don't coincide. Just because your kid might be experiencing some kind of bullying, but parents are so freaked out, we just jump to that kind of idea. Uh, and so there's two separate things, because most of us survive being, being dealt with bullies. And that's how most of it is. And so the key piece is, and to help parents understand, is just because you find out your kid might have been a target doesn't mean we have to go off the deep end and think, oh my gosh, my kid is going to... It's understanding that you have a partnership within the school who are now trained to help work things out. And so what might have been the kind of memory you had where you just kind of hope you could hide and run away or uh, you saw these mean girls and they now force you to do something, the idea has changed. And the last thing is, I'm going to be honest. All right, I want you to be honest. All right, just like you are now. So I'm going to ask you to do a quick exercise. I want you to think about how much money you've invested. Do you have careers? Nine more. Nine more, but you did? <laughs> right? But prior to this, did you have some kind of career? Yeah. Right? You're, you're, I mean, trust me, you work, work, work for every penny as, a, as a, that. Think about how much money you invested in your career, starting off with college and how much money you've spent for that career. You got a number inside your head? A lot? Right? Now, what I want you to do is think about how much money you've invested in learning how to be a parent. How many classes have you taken? How many courses? What kind of degree do you have in parenting? Not much, right? No. Right? Now, I, am, I wouldn't be surprised if there were at least one book you read. What to expect? <laughs> Come on, right? That was way before it, right? And every Sunday you would do what? Sit down and read and talk about it. So excited. Now, you see, you have, you have four, right? But were you reading the book by your fourth child? 
<laughs> we even read it by your second child, right? No, right. You start, you start, you start the, the second one, and then about halfway through, you're like, right, because you're too tired, too tired. And the truth is, we we don't. How do we learn how to be a parent? Real life trial and error. Either trial and error, or by our own parents, right? And for some of us, we do just the opposite. You know, did you ever at one point in your life as a teenager say, God, when I have kids, I'm not going to have the kids why my parents raised me, right? And then now that you have kids, totally. all of a sudden you start saying stuff, you're like, oh, oh, I sound like my mom, I sound like my dad, right? For, for me, my dad went bonkers one night because we never turned the lights off in the house. And my dad would always tell us, turn the lights off. And so one night he got so upset and crazy, he came home and just turned every single light on in the attic. There were lights I had no idea that we had. And my brother and I were like, Mom, I think Dad's losing it, right? Uh, fast forward X number of years, right? I now have rules in my house just for my thermostat. You know, you, the heat does not go on until November 1st. Air conditioning does not go on until May 1st, right? Ask Jess, she'll tell you. I don't joke about it. I'll take pictures. Who turned the thermostat on? It is October 15th. We got socks, we got sweatpants, we got, uh, you know... And it's so funny because we, there's no way for us to learn other than trial and error. And the biggest, the biggest fear we have is making some kind of mistake, right? And what we call, in this world, in terms of this, this, this honest, it's called scoreboard parenting. We're all about the scoreboard. We focus on the results, right? What are the victories? What are the wins? What are the grades? We focus this piece on comparing towards others. How does my kid compare everything else and we focus on mistakes are not okay. Even though we tell our kids we want to make mistakes, but then when they make a mistake, why make the mistake? And so part of this philosophy is understanding we want you to focus on effort, right? Now, for instance, now that your kids are getting grades, have you ever told your kid, I don't care about the grade. All I care about is if you put the best effort into it, right? And I imagine so far it's been pretty good. Yes. yes. Now, what happens is you say that, and then your child will come home, with the C. And the first thing you'll ask your child is, was that the best you could do? Well, yeah, of course. So we just told them all we care about is you giving the best effort. But in the long run, it's not, that's not really what we say something different, we do something different. And that creates additional anxiety and fear in terms of what's going and the pressures they're feeling at school. So the honest piece is that what we really want to do is help kids build resiliency and empathy. This district, as proven by the survey, has done a great job building empathy. But simultaneously, we want kids to be resilient, meaning we want to help kids understand it's okay to mess up. But the hard part as a parent, we have a hard time letting them make those mistakes. Why is it so hard for us to let our kids make mistakes? Because we don't want to see them struggle. We don't want to see them struggle. We don't want to see them in pain, right? And so we had a whole generation, we have, we referred to it, a tiger mom. Right? We have helicopter parents. We have snowplow parents. Right? We have lawnmower parents. All ways to help our kids avoid experiencing some kind of pain. Now, I'm just curious. Have you ever burned your hand on an oven before? Have you done that before? Burned yourself on something? Yeah. Did you ever go back and do it a second time? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Right? And so for us, when things go on with our kids, right, the pain they experience, pain is a good educator. Now, there's certain things that are obviously out of line, but as parents, you want to find out, we have to help our kids learn how to be resilient. And it's a, it's a big thing focused on social-emotional learning, which I know is a big part of what we do here at this particular school, social-emotional learning. We have to let our kids learn how to struggle. Because if we continuously go after them and do things for what they can, they cannot fly. For instance, are you familiar with butterflies? The process from caterpillar to butterfly, they go into a cocoon. If you're to walk by and you see that little butterfly poke its nose out the cocoon and you, you open the cocoon to help the butterfly, what would happen to the butterfly? It would die. Why? Not ready. It's not ready. And so for us, particularly with kids in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, as we be to think about what's going on, these kids have to build muscles in terms of how to struggle. And I've seen it time and time again when it comes to bullying and everything else, those kind of situations, there's opportunities to build partnerships to help build resilience as opposed to placing blame and thinking it's on somebody else. It's okay if your kid messes up. We have something called mistake, Richard. Just flush it down. But the idea is 
The focus over today, I kept saying better students, better people, is as parents, how can I help my kid become resilient and have empathy? And that's very important as you move forward, right? Now, this might sound like a, this might be so, this a little comic strip, right? Any questions so far? My parents bug me so much sometimes. It's like they go out of their way to be annoying just to irritate me. Dad comes in, hey, guys, how it's going? I rest my case. Now, I'm not sure if your, 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 your kids are at that moment where they just say you're annoying. Have you heard that yet? Yeah, you're annoying? Welcome. It's a great class to be in. Now, have you asked them what is it you do that annoys them? Right? Because I used to do that with my kids, too, my, as my Jessica would say. Well, but just tell me, what is it about me that annoys you so I can stop doing it? If I'm annoying you, tell me. And she's like, you're doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean you're doing it right now? You're doing it, I, please, just tell me. What I've, Dad, stop. You're annoying me. So I, you're at a lost cause. It is, it is the beginning of sixth grade to about 23. I will tell you, right? My daughter's 25 to about 20. It's, it's, a, it's a rough bit. Maybe you get lucky, catch a break. It is like the stranger comes in your house. All you can do is love them and support them. And this thing is just know that you're going to annoy them for whatever it is, right? I do want to spend some time talking about social media. Just want to make sure how many are familiar with social media. I know it sounds crazy. I want to make sure. Uh, approximately 9 out of 10 teenagers use social media. We're finding youngsters as young as third and fourth grade now using social media. One of the biggest ones that kids love to use is something called TikTok. Mm -hmm. You know what TikTok is? Oh, it's so much fun. Mom, you just did a real kid friend, I was just doing TikTok, right? But nine out of 10, and the thing is, it's, it's even so close, it's not 10 out of 10 quite yet, but it's nine out of 10 use social media, right? This is the most used. Facebook is now old. It is, it, it's, it's for old people, right? So just understand, you say Facebook, it's as if you're talking about a Walkman, right? The most popular one middle school, is this thing called Snapchat, all right? No, we love it. Oh, my gosh, it's so great. You take a picture, you can, get, you can put a, a, a face on it, you can put a little comment on it, you can send it, and it disappears, right? No, it doesn't disappear because you take a screenshot, right? And they have Snapchat groups and all these everything else, right? And, but hey, kids love it. Almost uh, 90%. Next one is YouTube, right? Uh, they love YouTubers. And they'll follow them like crazy. Instagram, right? Then it goes on down uh, WhatsApp. There used to be something called Vine, right? Which, which was really cool for a while. Now it's, it didn't last. These are things that our kids are into. And if they're not using your phone, they're using their friend's phone. So it's tough to protect. And the idea is understanding why is it so, have, I mean, what's so cool about this stuff? Any idea? Why do kids want to be a part of it? Everybody's doing it. When we were growing up, wasn't it things that we wanted that other kids had? I mean, for me, it was an IZOD shirt. I don't know why that was so cool at the time, but I had to have an IZOD shirt, right? It was that same concept of what they had. I had to get my own private phone. My brother had our own line, you know, the, right? We had our own phone line, and that was really cool, except there was one, there was one catch. We couldn't make a long-distance call until Sunday nights after 7 p.m., right? So it's very important to understand this is what they use, right? For the most part, they have an understanding of their, their policies, but 40%, two out of five, still don't set their, and their parents don't take the time to make sure they do that. Third, now the number's actually gone up to 26. They love to live stream. I like to, they love to live stream. And kids in high school are so dumb, they live stream parties where there's illegal, there's alcohol going on, and, they, they're, and they're just, they just don't realize. Like, Imagine, can you imagine bringing a camera to a party when you're in high school just taking pictures? It would take you two weeks to get the pictures processed, right? <laughs> no, they love to post pictures of themselves, right? They're also including their school name, where they live. They don't really have email anymore because email's passe. Uh, they have their Twitter handles, uh, but they are posting their cell phone numbers. Now, this is the piece to understand is we have to be able to talk to kids about their social media. If you don't talk, it goes back to the day when we used to be afraid to talk to our kids about, you know, sex and sexual relationships. We thought if we talk to them, that's going to give them the idea. I guarantee that the things we talked about and did in high school are now being done in fifth and sixth grade. 
and it's hard to digest, right? Because one of the biggest things we have is the social media and this concept of sex, where 10% of kids have a embarrassing picture and 20% wait. What? Did you hear that? Take a look at that again. 10% of teens have had embarrassing pictures posted without their permission. 20% have actually posted it themselves. And we're not talking kids, teens, in high school. We're talking kids in middle school. And it's become big issues in many situations, right? In some situations, I, got, I worked on a middle school in New York where kids had pictures and they shared it. For whatever it's called, it's called, you need to know, it's called sexting. You take a picture and it's, instead of calling texting, it's called sexting. And what happened is a female kid took a picture and shared it with her so-called boyfriend because they were in love and the boyfriend, right? And it kind of went viral. The school found out, right? And principal called, so this is what's happened. We're going to look at the, we're going to look at the phones, whatever it is. If you're kids, whatever, you're going to be consequences. Now, there are some parents that just delete the pictures all up. They don't want to be part of it, right? Those kids also got suspended. And the parents were upset because they didn't come forward. They were all part of it. And that's part of this resilience and empathy piece we have to teach in terms of social media. There's things called Snapchat groups. You're familiar with Snapchat groups? For whatever it's worth, I encourage you to take a look at your kids' Snapchat groups as often as possible. The agreement is if you want to have a phone, I can look at everything and all those pieces. I got called into a freshman situation in high school where a kid took a picture of a brand new student, just came into the school district, and because Snapchat, you can add different things around it, put a, put a big kind of hair, hair fro on him, put a little mustache, made sign a comment, loser freshman, right? And they post it in a Snapchat group. They all make some kind of comments. Well, the word got out, they had it. They contacted me. So I had the school identify all 26 people that were part of that Snapchat group and bring them into a room like this. And I said, when I get there in the morning, just have them come in and we'll start. So I walked in. I said, my name is Coach Randy. Uh, I have a picture I want to show you. And uh, if, I don't remember the exact name, uh, Lovely Handle 424, would you please share your thoughts about this picture? No, go on. Go ahead and share your thoughts about this picture. Lovely Handle 424, who are you? And then I went to the next one. Jasmine 29, what are your thoughts about this picture? Right? And what do you think happened in that moment? They went down, they went down. I said, we're going to identify ourselves because this is what your chat group looks like. And these are the comments that were said about this young man. The kid ended up leaving a week later. Freshman, not much older than six. And so this concept of social media and cyberbullying is very real. If you got bullied as a kid, chances are the worst thing that ever happened to me, they called me Randolina. Whoa, that's pretty tough for a sixth grade boy, Right? But this kind of stuff is very real and in your face. It's 24-7. And it's very important for us to understand how that goes on. With the selfie phenomenon and this whole thing about TikToks. They're fun and great, but you have to understand it can easily get out. The, the selfie, I mean, I, I love people taking pictures of their meals. I wish it went back to taking pictures of their meals. We've gotten far away from that. But I want you to think about if you were in grade school and you wanted to take a compromising picture of yourself. Right? This is what I'd have to do. I would have to take film and a camera, take 22 shots, whatever angle I wanted to take, right? And then I would take the film, and I'd rush it to CVS or Walgreens, and I'd drop it into a little bag, and I'd get extra copies. Let's say I wanted 100 copies, and I'd sit there and wait for about a week. I would come back, I'd get them. There's now 100 copies of me and my pictures, and I, and I just said I want to share these pictures. Then I'd have to come home, and I'd, I'd put them in 10 separate piles, and I'd say, you know what, I'm going to send this picture to, to Terrence, here's one to Eric, here's one to Craig, here's to Bobby, right? And I'm going to put an envelope in. And I'm going to write a little note that says, share with your 10 friends. And I'd mail them off. Snap of a button. And yes, kids know not to have their cell phones in school and class. And they know, but many times parents are doing what during the middle of the day? Texting their child and different information. Right? And oh, I forgot your class. Really? It's the middle of the day. Right? You're in the middle of the day. And so this whole phenomenon, they're taking pictures. They can take a quick picture, and it goes up in a heartbeat. And they don't realize the, the bigger picture of it. And so we have to help these kids understand, A, we have to teach them lessons. So out-of-school suspensions don't work. I've been in schools where they suspended a kid for bullying for three days. His parents took it as a chance to go on a five-day trip to Spain. Because why Why not? And so part of it, understand this partnership we have to do in terms of what this does. And so cyberbullying is a very real. It's about mobile phones, Internet, deliberately too upset. But sometimes it can be done not deliberately. 
And if kids are posting things on Snapchat, there are kids who are not seeing it. And they're not being it. You talk about someone being left out of a group. We now have kids who are not part of an Instagram situation, and these kids are together, and they weren't invited. So it's one thing to go to school. It's another thing to come home and see all these friends getting together, and you weren't included. And what that does, right? It is threats, harassment, embarrassment, humiliation, defamation. They love to impersonate each other. you got to make sure you tell your kids, do not share your password from now until they're 20. Do not share your password. What kids do, they think it's funny. They can get their password and they impersonate, right? General insults, prejudice base, homophobic, sexist, racist, you name it. Whatever you can do in person. Now, we know the biggest form of bullying is verbal. And that's what we found in the survey. The biggest form is verbal, but the fastest growing form is cyber, right? And part of it is because it just seems like it's so anonymous, right? It's... Is it really bullying? I mean, you're not in your face, you know, but it is, this is direct. You know who the kid is at school, right? It often occurs on school property, regular, even though it might. But now with the law, any of your kids play sports, right? So you, what sport does your, basketball. basketball, right? So they could be playing in a basketball game, right? And one coach is a win-at-all-cost coach, and they score 25 points, and they beat them 25 to 2, Right? And the kids tease and make fun of them. They come into school. Kids make fun of them because their team stinks so bad, right? Now it's the school's problem, right? And we've decided the school is the best place to deal with bullying because that's what most kids are. However, there is a responsibility to the wreck in the community, right? And so this is on or off. As a matter of fact, you get a kid on the bus on the way home, on the walk on the way home. It doesn't matter where it happens, right? Bullying, for the most part, old school, Poor relationship with teachers. Cyber bullies, oh, they are very savvy. They are very good. When we find out you're cyber, whew, I would have never seen it coming, right? Bullying, they kind of fear retribution. Cyber bullying fears the loss of technology. And I got to tell you, what's great for a while is when parents threaten the use of their cell phones. You know, that's called the, the, the pain, kind of the command control. But what you will discover as kids move on, as they get older, that taking away of their technology and everything else won't be effective because you're not dealing with the core challenges your kids are facing. Because they'll realize of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. What's the foundation of what kids need? They need food, shelter, right? Water, are you going to deny them that? As a matter of fact, whatever you want to do to me is fine because I'm, I, I'll just go to school, right? And they'll become very savvy about that. So you can threaten technology, which will work, to about 7th, 8th grade. By ninth grade, they begin to figure it out and realize, so if I take, take my technology away, I'm still going to eat, you're still going to take care of me, you're not going to kick me out, right? And so this kind comes in a very obvious, like when we used to think bullying was hitting, punching, shoving, teasing, name calling, gossip, right? Use of gestures, right? That's where we got our definitions, right? This is under the ra radar. However, the emotional piece cannot be, cannot be evaluated. We don't know what that is, right? And the different, there's what is called the inadvertent cyberbully. That's someone who posts a picture with her friends or her friends and doesn't realize that someone else wasn't there and wasn't purposely being. But right, then we have what we call the vengeful angel. Someone who's an angel, but they're trying to get back at somebody. And so they take somebody's picture. They, they, they can take a website. Sometimes even, some kids make fake Twitter accounts and post things up. Or because they have, they're, they're being a mean girl, they find someone's passcode. This has happened uh, and this is back when Facebook was big with them, they found someone's password, made comments on their f Facebook post about so-and-so in school the next day, and changed the password. The kid walks into school, everybody's mad at her for making those comments, and it never happened, right? The power hungry, it's no different than what we found. It's based on power, and the kids that are really tech savvy can really get to you in a really good way in terms of what we call revenge of the nerds. We also have... The types, flaming, harassment, cyberstalking, denigration, impersonation, outing and trickery, and exclusion. Outing and trickery is something that happens as kids get older, meaning they have an idea that they like somebody, and so they kind of impersonate just to get them to admit that they, they like somebody. And they go, ah, oh, now we caught you, we know you like so-and-so. Or better yet, uh, they denigrate them. They're cyberstalkers, and they'll say things in comments, which is why you want to make sure. And kids are very unlikely are unwilling to come forward about it because they're embarrassed and ashamed. 
Now, when kids are K1, 2, and 3, going to an adult was easy. Fourth and fifth and sixth grade, a little bit harder. Sixth, seventh, and eighth. So why is it that most kids do not necessarily approach adults as they get older? That's, that's been proven in the research as well. Any idea? They might get in trouble. They might get in trouble. Why else? You've heard the phrase. What's that? They're embarrassed. They're embarrassed. You heard the phrase, snitches get oh. stitches. stitches, right? And it seems more and more. And what I did today at school, and I do this a lot of time, I, I showed them exactly what the population of bullying looks like, meaning 85% of the school population we call bystanders. Right? And 10% are targets, and 5% are kids that have been, are, are the, the initiators, are, are the ones that bully, right? So I had... Five kids stand up in front of the whole group of school. And I said, which group is larger? Right? It's very plain and simple. Why is it that we, remember it's power-based, an imbalance of power, why does this large group give this 5% so much power? Why does that happen? Most people are upstanders. We learned about the upstander behavior with Kitty Genovese. Kitty Genovese was a young lady who was literally killed in the corner of New York City. 35 people watched and no one did anything. Right? A lot of times, this will come home too. Some kid will you'll come home and you'll just tell them, that's ah, Nanya. You know what Nanya stands for? Right. Nanya business. Right? And so, in those pieces, or they'll come and tell you something, listen, but don't call school. Right? Or, don't know this has happened to you, as a parent, you call and say, listen, I just want you to know this is going on, but please don't tell anybody that I'm calling. Please, please don't tell my taller. I, I promise my daughter I wouldn't say anything. There's such a fear for our kids that we forget that there's a partnership here. And the law states, and I don't want you to scare you from calling, we cannot help kids if we don't know about it. And the hard part is we talked about being an upstander. And part of the, uh, the conversation was that you don't stand up to the kids who bully. You stand up for the kids, right? So it's a stand up for and that paradigm shift over power. And that's where we're going to use the strength of the empathy of the students in that regard, right? And so we talked about this concept of a ripple effect. This is called the ripple effect, the power of pride. And I, I said, what happens when that, when that piece of water drops off? You might watch it. Boom. The ripple, right? And so then I put this particular word. What do you see up here? What do you see? Take a closer look. Evil, right? E V I L. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I can't help it. I grew up in that. It's just, it's just him, right? But I believe that in each of us there exists this good. Like you, like you go back and look at yourself. How could you have possibly done that? And, and yet you did it. And it weren't like you, you did it whether it's peer pressure or whatever. But inside of this constant struggle, it is so much easier to be mean, especially if the pressure and social conditioning of your friends is to be that way. Right? And I ask the kids, you know, why do kids act this way? And they say, well, because uh, they want to fit in or because they have something bad at home, right? Or it's their friends that are doing it, right? It's their closest friends acting that way. And so by the time of sixth grade, they know better. Of course they know better. But they're still afraid because they don't want to lose because it's that power imbalance in terms of, well, is it worth for me to stand up for somebody and then me be isolated and have no friends? Or not. And so we learn bystander behavior very early on, which is why most people don't stand up. Adults to this day. I'll use sports as an example. Have you ever been to a game where there's a parent in the stand screaming and yelling? All right? And you're just like, please just stop talking. Most people just kind of let it go. I don't. Right? Uh, and that, that, that's, a, that's a half a percentage. I'm the, person that, I'm the person that goes up and says, you know, I am the person, if someone lights a cigarette at a sporting event, I said, this is, so no smoking on school property. I'm a crazy, no smoking on school. I'm that guy. People come to me, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, but you can. But you can. Because I believe that we have to be role models in doing that. And so when you do that, that's a chance to talk to your kids about, I just want to share with you, let you know what I did. All right? That's a role model piece. It is so much more difficult to be good. It doesn't make sense. But it's... It's much easier because evil and badness is contagious. Energy attracts like energy. And our goal, again, was to help them create 
Better students, better people. That was a focus over and over again, right? And so I talked about pride from a student perspective. It's about performance, respect, integrity, determination, and excellence. And at each stage, we did something different, right? For parents, this is about parenting from pride. It is take the time to understand the stories of your children. Let them tell you their stories and do your best not to judge them. If they're tough stories, help them figure out how to empower themselves as if, right? Tell me more about that. We love to should on our kids. You should do this. You should do that. I'm telling you, at sixth grade, you can say, what do you think there's things that you can do? Encourage and learn to go get help. Now, I have been in a situation before where we weren't satisfied with the guidance counselor. It happens. What we did discover is my daughter had a teacher she loved dearly. And she found that teacher, talked to the teacher, and everything was fine. It was just an adult in the school. And because of that, she now has a great relationship with that teacher, still talks about him. And but what it did, it taught her the next year to find a teacher, right? And that is something we talked about, and we talk about a lot. The next thing is help your kids build resiliency and empathy. I am telling you, your kids are already have empathy. But my guess is you probably don't see it in the same way. Now, maybe you see it in a family, and you have to realize there's also bullying, but we call it sibling rivalry. And we kind of just accept it as sibling rivalry when it's actually kind of bullying behavior. But the idea is your kids are very empathetic. They've proven it, right? And so when I drop my kids off at school, my, 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 not so much my middle school anymore, my youngest one now, the last thing I say is, no, be kind today. I tell them, be kind. My older kids, I say, make, make smart choices. And the first thing I ask my daughter when she gets home from school is not what kind of homework she has, not what she did in school, was what did you do that was kind today? Because I want to remind them the important about empathy. Then they'll come and tell me about some things they're having a hard time with. Now, my, my eighth grade girl loves to complain right now. And I'll say, okay, you've got two minutes to complain. And she will, because she's good at it. Um, then my question is, what can you do about it? So when your kids come home in these situations, ask them, in this situation, what is not in your control? All right? There's only two things in our, in our kids' control, effort and attitude. And if you're going to honestly talk about all I care is your best effort, and they come home with a C, the last question you want to ask them is, well, that was your best effort. What you can say is, well, I've got a question for you. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 low, 10 high, how satisfied are you about that C? They might say 9, they might say 10. Say, great, what would it take to go from a 10 to 11? You're smarter than your kids, right? And they'll, they'll say 8, and you're like, how can you be satisfied? It doesn't matter. What matters is what they say, and then you say, why do you think it was a seven? Let me explain. What do you think you have to go from a seven to an eight? You put it back on them to empower them to figure out how they can build that resiliency on their own. And that is very important. Think of the message of the butterfly. For respect when it comes to pride and parenting is understand the power of their choices. Uh, one of the things I often do is I, you know, if you could just raise your hand. Oh, you just raise your hand. All right. Put your hand down. Thank you. Put your hand back up. All right, thank you for your hand down. Why did you raise your hand? Because you asked us to. Very nice. Are you sure about that? Yep. You sure about that? Yep. All right, first of all, you're probably being respectful because I'm a guest person, right? Why did you raise your hand? Yeah, pretty much because you asked us to. <laughs> yeah? Why did you raise your hand? Because you asked. Right? That's a, that's a reasonable response. But the truth is, what you did has less to do about me and more to do about you. Why did you raise your hand? Because you chose to. You chose to respect me and listen to me and do what I asked. Most of our kids are going to come to you and tell you that I don't have a choice, right? Or they're going to come to you and say, I can't be an upstander. I want to. My, uh, for my, my kids, know I've been doing this work for years. My 25-year-old, I'd say, sweetheart, she goes, Dad, I can't. I really want to be, but I cannot, but I'm so afraid. And so from that particular thing, when, they, when your kid says can't, you can say, no, 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 from this point forward, it's choose not to. Choose not to. You can call my 25-year-old. She will scream at you by saying that because I've been saying it for, since she was 12. Choose not to. This is about understanding their choice. You have a choice to demonstrate respect. This is how I expect you to be, right? This concept of tolerance, zero tolerance, but the idea is we want to go from tolerance to acceptance, right? And we talked about, I had a student in school today. Uh, she volunteered. Not really, but she, she allowed me to have her volunteer. And I demonstrated what tolerance looks like. 
you know, I think your hair is funny. I'm not quite sure I like the blonde hair. The earring looks all right. Your nails could be, uh, all right, but you know what? I'm going to tolerate you, right? So I'll sit next to you and tolerate you. As the idea is, I accept you for who you are. And what I had them do in that moment is I explained that everybody has a pancreas, right? And I said, if I said, your pancreas and your pancreas and your pancreas, and I put it on the table, could you tell whose pancreas belonged to who? Right? And we had a wonderful display of colors and, and creeds and, and gen- it was wonderful in the audience. It was fantastic. All right, so then what I had to do is come up with three things that you have in common with your neighbor that have nothing to do with you physically. Right? The truth is, we want them to understand they have much more in common than just how they look. Now, we all know everybody has a heart. But the truth is, we want kids to be understand that you're allowed to be here. We're going to accept you here. Right? What made, what made your transition to that school in the UK so easy? You think it was an accident? Yeah. It's a good change. Hmm? It's a good change. But what do you think allowed that to happen? My guess is that the, the group of kids that were there were willing to accept you in a different way than students that weren't. You know, and it was, um, it was an international school, so it was people from... Everywhere. All over the place. Like everyone knew everyone. Mm-hmm. It was, we were all coming into it. In the same place, yeah. right? That concept is of acceptance, we... we want to feel accepted, right? The other thing I talked about was this concept about integrity, right? And this is one of those kind of words like, I've heard it before, but what does it really mean? It's very simple. Doing something right even though nobody's watching, right? And I taught them a, a, uh, an African proverb called Ubuntu. So are you familiar with Ubuntu? In a software aspect. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's not a software. It's not the software. It is not the software. That's funny. It's the orange sign with the UBU, right? I know what you're talking about, right? So Ubuntu is an Af- African proverb, right, that says, I am because we all are. I am because we all are. Means, that means that uh, I am here that you represent me, I represent you, and so we're all here together. It's a fantastic concept. And as part of Ubuntu, the first three letters are UBU. And I tell my kids, and I think, it's, I think we're finding and discovering a generation are really okay with who I am. They're getting better at it. And they're much more accepting of people different back. It really is a phenomenal thing that's going on. We have a generation that seems to be advocating, understanding what's right, what's wrong, and is going to really make some significant challenges moving forward. But the idea is, you be you. All right? If this is who you are, you be you. Don't be afraid, and get them empowered. And to discover there's more kids. But let them know that there's nothing wrong with you. I get parents who contact me and say, Mike, can you fix my kid? I'm like, your kid's not broke. But this concept that like, they're machines or Walkmans that have to be fixed. We're human beings, right? So you be you. And the other thing is understanding what their values are, right? Sit down and talk to them about what, what do you value, right? What are your values? As a matter of fact, we often forget about that part and piece. We, we don't really, as kids get older, we have a hard time transitioning from that command control, right? Which is why we take the cell phones away. Command control. I command you, right? But the idea of values, it's called value-based parenting, and you explain why you want them to clean the room, right, based on your values. And you keep explaining it. And what we do in this regard as a parent is something called plant seeds. As opposed to forcing them, making it, I have confidence that you can do this. Kid comes home and says, I'm having a hard time with math. Please do my math for me. I have confidence you can go to your room or go to your table and figure it out. I know you can do it. You have a great brain, right? And nine times out of ten... They actually come back and they'll show you. The idea is you plant seeds, letting them know that they are capable, right? And so this concept of Ubuntu, I brought a kid up today, and I did this. What do you see when you see me? Your face. Yeah, what else? Your shirt. Yeah, anything else? Your smile. All right, very nice, thank you. (laughs) Right? Now ask me that question in return. What do you see? I see me. Someone who's a parent trying to figure out what the world is all about, trying to figure out how to manage work and life and balance, struggling to make sure we don't mess up. Right? We see each other. Mm -hmm. And what happened is we see each other, we think it's a physical piece. But we want kids to understand there's a whole different perspective in terms of who we are of integrity and that concept of acceptance. We need to help these kids. And it's so, it's in this environment, this district, and I've had the pleasure of having a wife who actually works here and comes home and says, oh my God, this place is amazing. And they brought me in to see just how fortunate you are to have the kind of staff and support you do, right? Determination, right? This I often get in terms of being determined. How have you been taught about mistakes? Everybody makes mistakes. Right? 
and you learn from your mistakes. But yet, when someone makes a mistake, what usually happens? Corrected. They get corrected or they get yelled at, right? The biggest fear kids start learning between middle school and high school is the fear of mistakes because of what happens when they make a mistake, right? It could be in the classroom. It could be in the athletic field. It could be in drama, whatever it is, right? I'd imagine you said you made some mistakes in your life, right? But the mindset about determination is to be able to flip it on the other side. No, no, no. It's not a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. Right? It's hard for us to adjust that. Because a kid comes home, we want to correct the mistake. But we try to force them, but they're not willing to learn because it doesn't make sense. And so imagine, I used to think I made like five or six big mistakes over the course of my life. But the truth is, if I hadn't had those moments in my life to do whatever it is, I wouldn't be literally here I am today speaking with you. That this whole concept that life is a journey, those kind of pieces. And so you're going to talk to them and say, I can't be an upstander. No, no, you can. As a matter of fact, I ask kids, if your friend was being teased by another friend, what would you do? What's the common answer? They'd probably, I'd go, I'd get my friends back. Now, let's say there's a kid who doesn't, you don't know, don't have any relationship, and you see that kid being teased. What would you do? What do you think the most common response is? Nothing. It depends. That's the response. Exactly. <laughs> depends on what? Well, if they would do it for me. What? It depends. It de- that's literally, it depends. Because they, it sounds weird. Well, but why wouldn't you? Why is it you have to know somebody to do the right thing? What's it going to take for you to be an upstander? Be determined, right? And we have seen kids who've been a target, and this is some great stories. They're all over the place on YouTube, right? Uh, of kids doing things that transform a community just for doing things for others. We know that humans, I mean adults, right, we're constantly striving for this thing called happiness, right? All we want to do is be happy. What's the, what's the parent blueprint we have used over the course of time as we raise our kid, right? Study what? Study hard, right? In order to get good what? Grades. And you have to get good grades in order to get to a good college, right? And you have to get into a good college in order to get a good job. And you have to have a good job in order to make a lot of Money. I have to make a lot of money in order to be happy. happy, right? And so what we've set up for our kids is the complete opposite of what happiness is. That happy, happiness is not some kind of destination you go through. Happiness is a state of being, right? We also know that what makes people happy is having what is called an attitude of gratitude, of being grateful and thankful. And having that kind of peace is, if you were being what would you want someone to do for you, right? What would it take? And being determined, my goal is to be the upstander. My goal, right, I saw this, okay, you didn't do this, what can you do next time? How can you stay, stick to that understanding that determination? And lastly, this concept about excellence, right? We have sometimes unreasonable bars of excellence, right? And I have heard many students complain that their parents' expectations aren't real. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but that's their perception. And they think that no matter what I do is never good enough for my parents. Every child wants to please their parent, whether it's in academically, in sports, in theater, in music. All they care about are pleasing parents. But there's this constant feeling that they're never good enough. It's a lot of stuff that we have as, as adults. We have that little parent on our shoulder that says, brack, brack, you're not smart enough, brack, brack, you're not good enough, whatever. My, I'm a terrible parent, right? I'm messing my kids up, yes, straight off the board you got to give your kids something to talk about in therapy. You're doing a good job, right? Uh, and so you take that concept. Stop focusing on that scoreboard approach. Excellent is not about results. It's not about comparing others. It's not about mistakes. You're not okay. It's about parent mastery. It's called ELM. It's about helping your kids understand about effort, learning, and mess ups. Okay, imagine you as a parent, right? You knew that you're doing the best you can. You're giving the best effort, right? But you're still willing to learn and that mess ups are okay. It's a cycle. So when you mess up, I have what is called the SW rule. You know what the SW stands for? So what? Right, you have four kids. You've got a lot of chance to mess up. I bet, you, right? Right? And so the idea is, and then we have, in our family, we have something called a mistake ritual. When they mess up or they make a mistake, we flush it. I say flush it down, flush it down, flush it down. We have, wipe it off. All right? We're big Taylor Swift fans. Shake it off. But the idea is, I want 
the kids, the kids I connect with, whether they're athletes or students of mine, to understand that excellence is not some destination, right? It is things that happen. And so if something is not working in your life, guess what? That's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. It's an opportunity. And if a parent chooses their best to kind of push it aside, we deny them the opportunity of what that purpose might be, right? And so very important to understand about excellence. Adversity provides growth. If you don't allow your kids to experience adversity, they will not grow. And in many situations, there are kids whose parents who did everything possibly good to get the kids in the best school in the best place, and the kid goes and cannot. And if you have not read a book called What, what Made Maddie Run, I encourage you to get the book What Made Maddie Run. It's a story about an incredible called the All-American Teen out of Bergen uh, High School in Bergen who went to Penn on a track scholarship, played soccer. And for whatever is going on, was never good enough. Even though she understood it logically, is this concept of a generation of kids who are more stressed than ever before and more anxious. All right? They're constantly being watched. All right? They're apps on their cell phones knowing where they are. Right? When we wanted to socialize and have a good time with our friends, I don't know, where did you go? We went to the park. Right? And we had, and we had very strict rules about when we had to come home. The lights went on. No one had all these basketball courts and soccer things in their backyard. We went to the park. We rode our bikes, right? And we just go and play. We weren't worried about whatever it is. The world and the stresses we had are just nowhere near the capacity of what goes on, all right? I am aware that this school has an online program that you can check your kid's academic success. I do know that the number of hits that goes on a monthly basis is in the five-figure numbers in terms of how many times parents go online to look at kids' grades. And yes, because it goes both ways, a school knows exactly how many times you're going online checking your kids' grades. And here's the sad part about it. It's often done in the middle of the day, and you get to see it, so by the time your kid, kid comes home, boy, you're ready to spit fire, right? And many times, many times the, the teacher messes up, all right? Or many times you try to catch your kid in a lie. And so you're already prepared to get them a lie. So what's that going to do? They're in a no-win situation. And so, I, frankly, I go on every now and then. My wife does it. My daughter goes on. I've told her, stop going on there. Because all that does is compare herself and focus on what she thinks matters. It's not about results. And I'm the kind of parent, she got a bad grade? Okay. What do you do next time? My daughter has, my oldest daughter had dyslexia, still, still is, has dyslexia and an auditory processing challenge. All right, that's where the information comes near. She's a little slow. When she gets it, she gets it. Her freshman year, after we discovered that she had this through middle school, she did great. In freshman year, her very first social studies test, she got an F. Right? I swear, she called me, Dad, I failed my exam. I, Woo! Yeah! Way to go! Yeah! Dude, stop it. No, no, I'm really proud of you. Because now you're going to realize you can survive and now you get your first F out of the way. I'd rather have you get it now your freshman year than later on. I said, so what happened? She goes, well, I thought I prepared, but I didn't prepare well enough. I go, why not? She goes, well, I thought I didn't have dyslexia anymore. I said, oh, what did you learn? I still have dyslexia. <laughs> I said, so what are you going to do about it? But that what it took for her. She went on and she, she got a nutrition degree. I mean, in, she became like, an, um, she went over the top. And we kept saying, sweetheart, have a social life. Have fun. She went over the top because she understood what it meant to be on her own. And we want to understand excellence, right, and what's excellent is across the board. There, there's, no, there's, no, there's no common trait of excellence. And we have to help our kids. Most of our kids put their excellence bar that way. It makes sense because they don't want to let you down. We want to find ways to keep stretching them. And if they don't hit it, flush it down. So what? How do we get you back up there to empower them? Tell me more about that, right? And so for the students, we have what is called the pride pledge. And we talked about each one of these things. And so with each one... Right? When I talked about performance, as I talked to you, for them it was about I'm amazing. That I'm amazing, I'm capable. That you have all the skills and tools inside you to do what you need to do. Right? Respect. Others, if I don't, who will? Right? Meaning, we want them to take responsibility that I have respect for you. If I don't, who will? We talked about integrity. Right? You know what? It's up to me. If, I, if it's up to me, it's up to me. Right? Determination, I can stand up. And follow this concept of excellence if not now, when? 
And as I said that, I read it in black. They read it in blue. They understood it. There's a pledge that was passed out. They're signing in class. Each day I will do, do my best. Now, I'm going to tell you another trick word, the word try. Have you ever used that word try? Try is an excuse word. You cannot try your best. You can only, it's, I'm sorry, it's Yoda. It's do or do not, there is no try, right? And so I tell my kids to, because you, you, ask someone, I tried to call you last night. Oh, really, did you try? How did you try? If you tried, you would have pushed send. I never got a phone call. Well, I tried, no, you didn't, right? So the idea is, we want you just to do your best, right? To show my pride to help her create a school community of acceptance, of acceptance. And the idea is for them to sign this pledge and talk about it. And I know in many situations, we now have weekly meetings. I believe it's happening in the middle school. Weekly meetings, which are designed to help kids deal with some of these life, character, education components in terms of what it means to navigate. And I, I will tell you, it'll be one of the greatest moments of their week when they come together. Curriculum goes out as far as the official curriculum of social studies and math, where they sit down with someone to talk about, A, their feelings, dealing with whatever stress and anxiety, things going around school, developing a sense of community. Because we know, and I'm also a sociology professor, that when you develop relationships with others, you're more inclined to connect. And we begin to realize that we're all in the same, thing to, same way. And so uh, the Alvarez Blue Prevention Program uh, has stated the most effective way to help deal with some of the bullying culture is when you have kids sitting in a room and they begin to realize we're all the same. And that's part of what's happening now on a regular basis in terms of what's happening. So this pride pledge is just not words actually be taken out over the course of the year with guidance and the teachers, right? Any questions? Questions? Just real quickly, Bishon, did you learn at least one thing tonight? One thing? Yeah. Lots of things? Did you, did you found your time was worthwhile. Are you glad you came out? Yeah. All right. Very nice. So I'm going to do what is called a shameless plug. Uh, I host something called Bad to the Dad. Uh, it's a podcast. It's Coach Randy Adam D. And what we do is we bring dads. There's not much out there for dads. Uh, and so we have uh, a podcast we kind of talk about our weeks as dads. And how we, we've all decided the most challenging job in the world is being a mom. So I'm just letting you know. That it'd be more than coal miners, more than people who 